Ladies and gentlemen, yes, I have been asked to move on. Sorry, that's the way it worked out. But anyway, I have a question. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. And my name is Eric Chabot, and our minister here is called Rashio Christie, Student Apologetics Alliance. And we've been here for a number of years. If you want to find out more about us, we have a table out there. Put your email down if you want to know what we do here. But been here for a number of years. And we've also had Dr. Frank Turk here many, many times. So he's no stranger to the Ohio State University. Of course, you can follow him online at crossexamine.org. You know all his materials are out there, which are amazing. But we certainly want to welcome him back to the Ohio State University. So thank you for being here, Dr. Turk. Buckeyes. Who are you? What is your identity? Are you going to live on after you die? Is there any hope for life? Or are we all just overgrown germs, one day destined to become worm food, and it's over? seems to me over about the past decade, particularly in our country, and maybe just in Western culture in general, there has been an identity crisis that has crept into the minds of most of us, asking questions like, who am I? What's life all about? In fact, I want to show you a short video to get started here. This video was recorded at... Uh, Washington University back about seven years ago when this identity issue began to come up and I think it illustrates quite well what's happening in our culture and then we'll talk about how to address it. But how far does it go? And is it possible to be wrong? We went to the University of Washington. Are you aware of the debate happening in Washington State around um, the ability to access bathrooms, locker rooms, spas based on gender identity and gender expression? I, I think people should be able to have access to the facility. I think uh, bathrooms could and potentially should be gender neutral because there doesn't need to be a classification for differences. I think people definitely should have the ability to go to whichever locker room they want. Uh, I feel like at least public universities should do their best to accommodate for those who do not have a specific uh, gender identity. You know, whether you identify as male or female and whether your sex at birth is matching to that, you should be able to utilize the resources. So if I told you that I was a woman, what would your response be? Good for you, okay. Like, <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you. I'm a toy. Really? I don't have a problem with it. I ask you how you came to that conclusion. If I told you that I was Chinese, what would you respond to me? I mean, I would be a little surprised, but I'd say, good for you. Like, yeah, be who you are. <laughs> I would maybe think you had some Chinese ancestor. I would ask you how you similarly came to that conclusion and why you came to that conclusion. Um, I would have a lot of questions, just because on the outside, I would assume that you're a white man. If I told you that I was seven years old, what would your response be? Um, I wouldn't believe that immediately. Uh, I probably wouldn't believe it, but I mean, I, it wouldn't really bother me that much to go out of my way and tell you no, you're wrong. I'd just be like, oh, okay, he wants to be seven years old. If you feel seven at heart, then it's <laughs> okay, so, yeah, good for you. <laughs> so if I wanted to enroll in a first grade class, do you think I should be allowed to? Uh, probably not, I guess. I mean, unless you haven't completed first grade up to this point. <laughs> if that's where you feel, like, mentally you should be, then I feel like there are communities that would accept you for that. I would say so long as you're not hindering society and you're not causing harm to other people, I feel like that should be an okay thing. If I told you I'm six feet, five inches, what would you say about Why? Because you're not. <laughs> no, I don't think you're If you truly believe you're 6'5", I don't think it's harmful. I think it's fine if you believe that. It doesn't matter to me if you think you're taller than you are. So you'd be willing to tell me I'm wrong? I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. No, but I say that um, I don't think that you are. I feel like that's not my place as a 
as like another even to say someone is wrong or to draw lines or boundaries? No, I mean, I want to just go like, oh, you're wrong, and that's wrong to believe me. So, I mean, yeah, it doesn't really bother me what you want to think about your height or anything. So, I can be a Chinese woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. But I can't be a six foot five Chinese woman. <laughs> if you thoroughly debated me or explained why you felt that you were six foot five, uh, I feel like I would be very open to saying that you were six foot five, or Chinese, or a woman. It shouldn't be hard to tell a five nine white guy that he's not a six foot five Chinese woman. But clearly it is. Why? What does that say about our culture? What does that say about our ability to answer the questions that actually are difficult? Well, what do you think? It seems like in our culture, the number one sin is to tell people they're wrong about anything. It's wrong to tell people they're wrong. It seems like there's some self-referential problem with that. The one young lady said, I don't think it's right to draw boundaries. Question, how long do you think you'd be alive if you didn't obey boundaries? Not very long. I think we have an identity crisis, and I'd like to do this in four or five steps. First question we're going to deal with is, who are you? The second question is, what is truth and love? Because it seems to me that many of us in our culture either don't believe in truth or they have a wrong definition. I'm sorry to say that. A wrong definition a difference of opinion about what love is, then we're going to talk about should you follow your heart because if there is a mantra in today's culture, it's follow your heart. Be your authentic self. Whatever your heart tells you, you ought to follow it. Then we're going to talk about how to find ultimate hope and identity. And if I time this just right, we'll have absolutely no time for questions and objections. <laughs> That's my goal here. No, I don't know if you've noticed, but... We here in America don't all agree with one another, so if you don't agree, that's just fine. We'll have an open mic later and we can interact, or if you have a question, we'll get to that a little bit later. But we're going to start right here on who are you. You guys ready to go? All right. Are we just, as I said earlier, overgrown germs? Are we here by some sort of evolutionary process that didn't have its end in mind? Or is there some designer out there that designed us in a certain way and wants us to live a certain way? Well, let's go all the way back to you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? That's human. In fact, let's go back even further than 11 weeks. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? <laughs> I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see a few older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. <laughs> when your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States. 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg and then there was a race and you won that's right you can give yourselves a hand you beat out 300 million others you have blown away anything michael phelps has done in fact seeing some of you limping here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool but you were now your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.5 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, all the letters in the right order, and that microscopic soldier. And your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book, and it contained the other half of the 3.5 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, 
all the letters in the right order. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. Do you know you have not received any more genetic information from that point till right now? Your genetic information has just duplicated itself. In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. You say, well, Frank, you can't legislate morality. Newsflash, ladies and gentlemen, all laws legislate morality. The only question is whose morality? I don't want to legislate my morality. I don't want to legislate your morality. I want to legislate the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul in Romans, his letter to the Romans says that this morality is written on our hearts. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From this point till right now, and by the way, see if this sounds like this is some sort of random process. From this point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. For mostly, anyway. <laughs> Some cells became brain cells, others lung cells, others heart cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 Knock it off! I mean, are you thinking about this? Are you sitting there concentrating, going, hold on, Frank, I got to concentrate to make new red blood cells. They're coming right up. No, this is just happening. How is it happening? Well, Aristotle noticed something 2,400 years ago. Of course, he didn't know anything about blood cells or any of this, but he did notice that all of nature's going in a direction. For example, why does an acorn, if it's properly nourished, always go in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree, or a birch tree, or a seahorse? You say, well, Frank, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Well, who programmed it? And by the way, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground thinking, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No! But if properly nourished, it reliably goes in the direction of becoming an oak tree. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, and it doesn't, it's unconscious, but it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward that end. This is what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God. That all of nature's going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, there must be someone directing it. Now notice, this is not an argument for God from the beginning of the universe. This is not a Big Bang argument for God. That's another argument. This is the argument that says every single second the universe exists, someone is directing it. You ever wonder why the natural laws are what they are and why they're so consistent and persistent? Where do laws come from? They come from lawgivers. In fact, if you think about this, what God is to the universe, a band is to music. If a band were up here playing music, the band would be creating and sustaining the music. What would happen to the music the second the band stopped playing? Music would be over. Same thing is true with God. God creates the universe. He creates the natural laws that govern it. He creates you, and he sustains the universe and the natural laws that govern it. And he sustains you every single second the universe exists. This is a right now cause. This is why people like the Apostle Paul could say, in him we live and move and have our being. And Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. 
In other words, there's not a, just a being out there that creates a universe and then leaves it. That would be called deism. Th there's evidence that there's a being out there that did create the universe and he sustains it every single second we exist. So no, this is not a random process. This is a highly directed process. In fact, this is why we can do science. Why can we do science? Because the world is reliably going in a direction. It does the same thing over and over again. And we can see reliable cause and effect. This is also how we know God exists. We know God by his effects. If there's a creation, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a creator. If there's design in the universe and design in you that we've just seen, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a designer. If there's a moral law written on your heart, you know intuitively right and wrong that you don't go into grammar schools and shoot nine-year-olds. That's the effect. You're reasoning back to a cause, a moral law giver. If you have the ability to reason outside your skull, and you access these immaterial laws of logic, that's the effect. You're reasoning back to a cause of mind. If there's evidence that a man died and then rose from the dead 1,990 years ago tomorrow, that's the effect. You're reasoning back to a cause, someone like God who could raise someone from the dead. So you're always reasoning from effect back to cause. This is, this is what scientists do. They're reasoning from effect back to cause. And the universe and you are too well put together to think that this happened without some powerful cause or continues to happen without some powerful cause. Now, early on in the book of Genesis, here is what it says. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You are not the result of a blind process. And even if you were, where did the universe come from and the processes come from, the laws that come from, that made you? There's someone behind this universe. So what does that mean for us? Well, let's keep going. What is truth and love? Because everybody believes in love. The question is, what is it? But some people today don't believe in truth. Now, whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand, and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, Buckeyes. I think the Wolverines would have done better. I mean, come on. He did not say it that way. You can't handle the truth. The movie would have gone nowhere. Here's how he said it. All right, let's try it again. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Now, that felt better, didn't it? Didn't you always want to say that here at the, at the Ohio State University? Well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth, I got my truth, there is no the truth, everything's relative. Well, there's just one big problem with this kind of thinking. If someone were to say to you, there is no truth, you should ask that person a question, what should the question be? Is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. Did I say that right? I know that can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough, but that's because this is a self-defeating statement. To say there's no truth is actually a truth claim. Yet tragically, tragically, most of our universities and many of our high schools have bought into the postmodern relativistic idea that there is no truth. Now, what is the current tuition at the Ohio State University? Approximately. A lot. <laughs> it's it's Forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, something like that, right? Now think about this. I'm not saying this is true everywhere at Ohio State, but why would you ever go to a college or a university that would tell you the truth that there is no truth? That's not why you're here. You're not here to learn opinions. You're here to learn truth, apparently, right? Isn't that the whole goal? 
Yet some people claim there's no truth. In fact, there's an easy way to point out these statements when they're false. All you need to do is turn the claim on itself. So if someone says there's no truth, you turn the claim on itself, and you ask, is that true? All right, let's just do a couple more of these just to get the hang of this. Suppose someone says all truth is relative. What question would you ask that person? If you turn the claim on itself, what question are you going to ask? Yeah, is that a relative truth? No, this is an absolute truth claim claiming all truths are relative. It's obviously self-defeating. Now, in our culture, it's not often said this way anymore. Actually, it's often said this way. There isn't the truth, only my truth. You know, you have your truth, I have my truth. You live your truth, I'll live my truth. We'll all get along. It sounds so right, doesn't it? It sounds like we ought, all ought to believe this. It sounds so Oprah, doesn't it? Like everybody should just, yeah, this is the way we get along. You live your truth, I live my truth, we all get along. There's just one big problem with this. It's logically self-defeating. Why? Because if somebody says there isn't the truth, only my truth, you simply want to ask them, is that just your truth or the truth? You see, if you're claiming that this is just your truth, this statement up here, okay, it's just your opinion, but why should I believe it? It's just an opinion, right? But if you're claiming this statement up here is the truth, well, the first half of this statement says there are no the truths. Can everyone see that this is a the truth statement claiming there are no the truths? There are no the truth statements? It's like saying I can't speak a word in English, right? It's logically fallacious. It violates the law of non-contradiction. In fact, how many people in here have ever taken a, a course in logic? All right, you see these people? These are the homeschoolers. Here they are, right here, okay. If we taught logic in public school, things would be a lot better. We wouldn't fall into these traps. Now, I know it's not popular to say this, particularly on a college campus, but there's no such thing as your truth. There's no such thing as my truth. There's just the truth. If you're going to claim you have your own truth, you might as well claim you have your own math. I mean, imagine if Eric, Eric Chabot, who is the uh, president here, the chapter director of Ratio Christi, who just introduced, got this whole thing kicked off. Suppose he said to me, hey, Frank, can you stay around an extra day and help me around the house? I need some... Some work done, I'll pay you $10 an hour, you just tell me how many hours you work, and I'll, I'll pay you. Now, actually, Eric would never do this, he doesn't pay that much. Anyway, <laughs> suppose I go over his house tomorrow and I work for 15 hours, and he goes, okay, what do I owe you? And I go, Eric, you owe me, let's see, $10 an hour times $15, that's $150,000. He goes, I don't owe you $150,000, I owe you one hundred and fifty. dollars Suppose I were to say to him, oh, you don't understand, I have my own math. <laughs> What's he going to say? You're crazy. Only Washington has their own math, okay? <laughs> we don't have our own math. There's, there's just, there's not my math and your math. There's just the math. There's not my truth or your truth. There's just the truth. Now, this is going to come into play a little bit later here, so just stick with me. What about the issue of love now? In fact, let me ask you this. Does love require approval? Because in our culture, people think love requires approval. If you love me, you'll approve of what I do. Let me point out why that's not the case. How many people in here are parents? All right, how many people in here are former children? Okay, good. That's all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, if your parents approved of everything you wanted to do as a child, would they have been loving parents? No. Parents have to stand in the way of evil. You can't approve of everything a kid wants to do. That kid will destroy him or herself. You need to stand in the way of evil. You don't approve of everything. You approve of what's right and good, and you oppose what isn't. Now, with regard to the Bible, you know there's a passage in the Bible that all people read at their wedding, but nobody obeys. It's 1 Corinthians 13. Notice if you read 1 Corinthians 13, there's not a feeling in it, because love is not about feelings, it's about actions. It's about seeking what's best for the other person. And here's some of the phrases the Apostle Paul uses when he talks about love. Love always protects. Love does not delight in evil. Yet there are people in our culture that want you to approve of what God would consider evil. It's not loving to do that. Love rejoices in the truth. Love always perseveres. Yet I see Christians, even Christian pastors, 
giving in to the culture. In fact, I submit to you the great atheist Richard Dawkins has more courage than most, than most American pastors. Because Richard Dawkins has truthfully said that some forms of Islam are very dangerous. And yet many American pastors won't say that. Richard Dawkins has also said truthfully that you can't change your biology. It's science. You're either a man or a woman. He said, I'm sorry if you don't like that. I'm just telling you the truth. It's science. Yet you have pastors in our country hiding behind their lecterns, hiding under their desks, afraid to speak the truth. It's not loving when you hide the truth. It's only loving when you speak the truth and you speak it in a way that people can, can at least hear it. They may not accept it. They may not like it. But just like a parent with a child, you can't approve of what people want to do if it's going to hurt them or others. I mean, imagine you went into the hospital and you needed an operation and you heard the doctors right next to you saying, uh, but I can't tell her the truth. It will hurt her feelings. You go, no, I want to hear the truth. What is the truth? Give it to me. Thomas Sowell, the brilliant economist who's now 92 years old, grew up in Harlem, couldn't read, but somehow taught himself to read, eventually got a PhD and taught at some of the top universities in the world, put the issue of telling people the truth like this. He said, when you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. For those of you who are Christians in here, Jesus gave us one new command. You know what the new command was? Love one another as I have loved you. How did he love us? He sacrificed himself for us. So you know what happens when we tell people what they need to hear? We're sacrificing ourselves to help them. And the reason we often don't tell people what they want to hear is because we don't want to get the blowback from what their consternation, that we don't agree with them. We're trying to protect ourselves when we tell them what they want to hear. We're essentially sacrificing them to protect ourselves. That's what we're doing. And Jesus said, no, you need to tell people the truth. And Thomas, I don't even know if Thomas Sowell's a Christian, but he's spot on right here. We need to tell people the truth. So, truth does exist. Truth is what corresponds to reality. Love does exist. It, seek what's, it seeks what's best for the other person, not necessarily what the person wants. The next question is, should you follow your heart? Here's, where, here's, the, here's the, it seems to me, this is ground zero of the identity crisis. Let's talk about how people have found their identity in the past. There's three basic paths. You can look out to other people, you could look into yourself, or you could look up to a God. I'm going to leave Satan out of it for a while. We're not going to look down, okay? We're going to look out to other people, into ourselves, or up to God. And in ancient culture, you looked out to other people. You followed your family. If your father was a potter, you were a potter. If your father was a blacksmith, you were a blacksmith. If you were a woman, you took care of the house. That's just the way things were in ancient culture. Modern culture isn't like that. Modern culture, you don't look out to other people. Modern culture says you follow your heart. You see what your desires are on the inside, and then you do whatever it takes to make sure that dream becomes a reality. You cross every brook. You swim every ocean. You climb every mountain. Is that some Disney movie or is that the sound of music? I can't remember which that is, but you get the idea, right? And don't let anyone tell you that you ought not follow your heart because that's the way that you can find your true authentic self, your true identity. Now, religious culture says you follow the rules. Now, it may be a bit of a surprise that none of this is Christianity. In fact, we'll see at the end, it's not follow the rules. We'll, we'll get there. But I want to concentrate on modern culture because follow your heart is really the mantra of our day. Should you follow your heart? And here's what I think is the psychology behind it. We think today that if you have some idea or some desire on your heart, 
that that idea or desire is you. That's your identity. And for our friends in the LGBTQ community, this is why I think they get upset if you were to say that, say, same-sex behavior is morally wrong. They think you're attacking them because their desire is them. What's on their heart is them. That's their identity. And so they think they're attacking or you're attacking them. But I don't think this is the right way to look at identity. In fact, unfortunately, this is happening even in the church. That people are identifying by what they do sexually. You know what this really is? I'm going to be a little bit of blunt here. I think the new religion in America is neology rather than theology. It's all about what I want. Well, if it's all about what you want, why even read the Bible? Because the Bible's God's word, not your own. You don't need, to, you don't need an external input if it's all about you, do you? That's part of the problem. But this is not really you. We need to point out that just because you have a thought on your heart doesn't make that your identity. Although there is a sense in which this is true, we'll get to later. Your identity is not whatever you think about. If your identity was what you thought about, most men would be women and most women would be chocolate. <laughs> right? I mean, let's be honest. Come on. So should we follow our hearts? Should you follow your heart? Well, I think there are three reasons you ought to say no. First of all, our hearts are deceitful and selfish, and we'll go through these three. Secondly, our hearts are conflicting. You might have two opposing heart desires at the same time. Which one are you going to follow? And thirdly, which this is often forgotten, our hearts are changing. We're going to get into, and I think you're going to realize from your own experience, your heart has changed several times over your lifetime as you've progressed through life. You're not the same person you were in high school, thankfully. Right? So let's start here. Our hearts are deceitful and selfish. And maybe the best way to illustrate this is let's suppose before you came here tonight, you went into the bathroom to get ready, you looked in the mirror, and as you looked in the mirror, you saw that there was a sign attached to your head. And it transmitted every single thought you had in big LED letters across this sign. You couldn't turn the sign off. You couldn't cover it. You couldn't get rid of it. Anyone who saw you that day would be able to read every thought you had. Would you be sitting here tonight if that happened to you? I wouldn't leave the bathroom, would you? No, why? Because you know as well as I do that our hearts are evil. By the way, this is no extra charge for this. This is why you can't remember names when you meet people. Why? Because you're meeting somebody. Hey, how you doing? You're not thinking of the name. What are you thinking of? You're thinking that is the ugliest shirt I've ever seen. Right? You're going, where'd you get your hair cut? Walmart? You know? You're thinking, do I even want to know you after this introduction? Can you do anything for me? That's what we think. Right? We're evaluating people. In fact, we judge people based on their appearance in the first four seconds. Because we're judgmental. We're thinking of ourselves. We're not thinking of the other person. We're trying to see if this person can help me or not. And if you think about this, this is just part of our human nature. And of course, the prophet Jeremiah put it this way. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Question, is it easy to be bad or easy to be good? It's much easier to be bad. You have to teach a two-year-old to say mine. No, he's already got that, right? You've got to teach the two-year-old to share, don't you? Because we're naturally bent toward evil. We're naturally bent toward selfishness. This is part of our human nature. As Augustine said, depravity means that we have a propensity to sin, we're bent towards sin, we're, bent, we're biased towards sin, and we have a necessity to die. A propensity to sin and a necessity to die. We are fallen. In fact, 
It's very easy to be bad. It's hard to be good. We're very susceptible to sin, as the Babylon Bee recently found. Study finds 100% of men would eat any fruit given to them by a naked woman. <laughs> right? You think you would have done better than Adam, guys. No, you wouldn't. You'd have done the same thing. How many of you know my friend Jay Warner Wallace? Some of you may know him. He's been here at the great Ohio State University. Uh, he is a cold case homicide detective who has been on Dateline more than any other homicide detective because he solves murders decades old. He's also written a book called Cold Case Christianity. And uh, his website is coldcasechristianity.com. You want to avail yourself of it. He's written a bunch of other great books. And Jim says that whenever he finds a body that he knows has been murdered, he knows there's only three reasons why that guy's dead. He doesn't have to track down a thousand motivations. He says, that guy's dead for one or more of these three reasons. There was either a sex issue, a money issue, or a power issue. Sex, money, or power. Those are the three things that can drive people to murder. In fact, those are the same three things that drive any of us to sin. Why? Because sex, money, and power are good things. In fact, they're so good, we'll often take shortcuts to get them. So these are the things that can trip us up on our path to find out really who our identity is. Because we may be motivated selfishly by either or all of those three motivators. In fact, this is exactly what John the Apostle said. He said, this is all that's in the world. He said, these are the three traps. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Notice the lust of the flesh, sex. The lust of the eyes is money. The boastful pride of life, power, pride. There's a lot that falls under the pride of life. If you think about it, these are the three things that motivate us. And any one of us are susceptible to this. In fact, any one of us can destroy our lives irreparably by illegitimately going down one of these three roads. And we need all these things, or all these things are good things. But if we make them the best thing or the only thing, that's where we're going to ruin our lives and others. In fact, we're not supposed to follow our heart. I think the second most important verse in the entire Bible for today's culture, second most, because I still think the gospel is the most important aspect of the Bible, I think this is the most important verse we all need to take to heart. Even if you're not a Christian, this is good wisdom. Here it is. Above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart. doesn't say follow your heart. Guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. If you don't guard your heart, you're going to be susceptible to illegitimate sex, illegitimate gain, money, and illegitimate power. And you might... Things might go well for you for a while doing that, but ultimately it's going to catch up to you. In fact, even Hollywood gets this. My son and I wrote a new book called Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. And we say that real life heroes and those in Hollywood's most successful movies don't follow their hearts, just the opposite. You would never think a movie was good if a superhero, for example, followed his heart. Let me give you one example of this. Uh, one of the chapters we have in here is about Iron Man. How many in here have seen Iron Man or any of the Iron Man movies? Okay, brilliantly played by Robert Downey Jr. Now, when this movie starts, the first one starts, you don't think Robert Downey Jr. is ever going to be a hero. Why? Because he's a playboy. He's a billionaire playboy. He's got sex, money, and power. And it's all about him, right? Then you know the story. One of the weapons that he's selling to terrorists detonates near him and actually put shrapnel in his chest. 
And then he has to have a device put into his chest to guard his heart from encroaching shrapnel. No, I'm not saying the movie writers even knew they were doing this, okay? But if that device fails, he dies. Then Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man goes on this long character arc development over many, many movies until you get to Endgame. And at the end, spoiler alert, Robert Downey Jr. actually sacrifices himself to save the world from the evil Thanos. He's the one that you would never think in the beginning he's going to do this, right? He's going to turn tail and run, but he doesn't. Now imagine if you got to Endgame, Robert Downey Jr.'s there with all his Avenger buddies, there's Thanos, and Robert Downey Jr. looks over at his other buddies and he goes, guys, I'm just not feeling it today. I don't want to take on this guy. I got to get back to following my heart and taking care of just me. I'm out. And then the movie ended. Would anyone go, well, that's inspirational. No, even Hollywood gets that the mantra, follow your heart, is not a hero mantra. In fact, if you look at the major blockbuster movie franchises of the past four or five decades, including Star Wars, including Batman, including Lord of the Rings, and even Harry Potter, you see that all of the heroes in all of those movies are borrowed from the greatest story ever told. Who's the greatest story ever told? Jesus. The key to all of them being successful is they sacrifice. And that's what Jesus does for us. So Hollywood gets it. You can't just follow your heart. That's not only going to be damaging, it's not inspiring at all. What's inspiring? When you will put your life on the line and sacrifice something you love to take care of somebody else. That's love. The second reason that you can't follow your heart at least not consistently, is because your heart is conflicting. Yeah, you want to be thin, but you love that donut, don't you? Which heart are you going to follow? The heart that wants health and thinness or the heart that wants the donut? You like that shiny new thing. That's one heart. The other heart is, I don't want to go into debt. I want to have financial freedom. Which heart are you going to follow? You want to be free from any encumbrance. On the other hand, you want to have a family. Which heart are you going to follow? I don't know about you, but you got you to make a commitment one way or the other. I mean, when I got married 37 years ago, it put, it put a big damper on my dating life, right? I just, I didn't have the freedom that I had before I was married because there's a new commitment that's being made. Some of you may want children. That's one heart. Other you may go, no, I, want, I don't want the encumbrance of children. Which heart are you going to follow? And this is one of the tragic things with some of the transgender movement right now. I was talking to a friend of mine today, actually this morning. She's on our board at crossexamine.org. She's 69 years old. She works at Starbucks, not for the money, but for the ministry. There are four people, young people, trying to transition in this Starbucks. And she, during her break, talks to them and says, when I was your age, I did some things I'm still paying for. And they weren't nearly as drastic about, of, of things about what you're about to do. What you're about to do is irreversible. Are you sure you want to? I don't want to have kids. Are you sure? How do you know? How do you know your heart's not going to change? So which heart are you going to follow? Hearts are conflicting. In fact, C.S. Lewis I'll put everything well. Here's what he said about happiness. Surrender to all our desires obviously leads to impotence, disease, jealousies, lies, concealment, and everything that is the reverse of health, good humor, and frankness. For any happiness, even in this world, quite a lot of restraint is going to be necessary. If you haven't noticed, if you want to be successful in life, whether you're a Christian or not, quite a lot of restraint's going to have to be demonstrated. 
You know, one of the things they've discovered, researchers have discovered about kids who are going to be successful later in life is whether or not they can delay instant gratification. You've seen these experiments, right? They bring this little kid into a room with nothing. They just put M&Ms on the table, like one M&M, and they go, if you cannot eat that for five minutes, I'll give you five more, right? Some kids immediately go, got to have it now, right? Other kids will wait. Then there's kids in the middle that put their head on the table and stick their tongue out, right? Like, can I just get a little lick of that, you know? It turns out the kids that had the ability to delay instant gratification when they do longitudinal studies on these, these, these are the kids that turn out to be successful. Because you can't follow your heart without restraint. Without moral restraint. In fact, John Mark Comer, a pastor, put it this way. He said, giving in to the desires of our flesh does not lead to freedom in life as many people assume, but instead to slavery and in the worst case scenario, addiction, which is a kind of prolonged suicide by pleasure. Prolonged suicide by pleasure. Those of us in this room that have suffered from addiction, are you free? No, you're not free. You're a slave to whatever the addiction is, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's pornography, whether it's social media, whether it's approval, recognition, whatever it is. You're not free. You're enslaved. Again, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. The third reason, and maybe one of the most important reasons that we can't just follow our heart is because our hearts are changing. Do you realize that about a decade ago, very few young women experienced what is known as gender dysphoria, that they thought they were men when they're really biologically women. Well, over about the past decade, there's been a literal explosion of women claiming to have gender dysphoria. It used to affect one out of every 10,000 men. And now there's been a six or about a 6,000% explosion of young girls claiming they're trans. Do you know what many of the experts I'm reading say this comes from? Where's it coming from? It's coming from social media. What's the easiest way to get approval? In fact, when you're a young person, what do you want more than anything else normally? You want approval. You want to fit in, right? What's the easiest way to get approval in our culture today? Claim you're trans. Everyone's going to applaud you. You're going to get all sorts of attention. And anyone who claims that this, could, this is not the right road for you, you're going to hurt yourself and others, they're going to be shouted down or canceled. This is where this comes from. It's a social media contagion. In fact, um, Abigail Schreier, not a Christian, but wrote a book four or five years ago called called Irreversible Damage, How the Transgender Craze is Seducing Our Daughters. She said in some schools she's visited, 30% of the girls are claiming to be trans. Wait, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. It was one in 10,000 men claiming? And now you have in some schools 3,000 out of 10,000 girls? What's happened? There's nothing new in the water. It's social media. In fact, my friend that I just mentioned is on our board, 69 years old. She was saying this morning that when she goes into the break room with these young girls and she has a great relationship with them, they sit on their phones on TikTok videos, one after another, trying to be affirmed that what they're doing is a good thing. They, they need the constant reinforcement that what they're doing is good not only on TikTok, but on Reddit. Without that constant reinforcement, they start having doubts as to what they're doing. And if you look at the medical data, do you know that nobody actually ever transitions? It's impossible. You can't change all 100 trillion of your cells from one sex to another. What happens is, is people are put forever 
on drugs to keep their body, force their body to go in a different direction. Nobody ever completes a transition. You're sentencing yourself to a lifetime of drugs, skin grafts, operations in a futile attempt to change your biology. You can't do it. Now you can call me transphobic for that, fine. I'd be afraid of mutilating my body and not being able to reverse it. Maybe you ought to think about that because your heart will change. In fact, do you know 80% of young people that have gender dysphoria grow out of it by the time they're 18? So why would you ever try and convince a child or allow a child to go through irreversible hormone treatments or surgery for a problem that is likely to fix itself in just a few years. In fact, I know it's going to sound odd, but do you realize that puberty is one long transition? That's what it is. You're transitioning from a child to an adult, and there are going to be times you're going to be confused. That's no reason to start taking Lupron. Do you know what Lupron is, by the way? Do you know what we've used Lupron for in the past? We used to give Lupron to sex offenders to chemically castrate them, and now we're giving it to teenagers. Is this a good thing? At least wait till they're old enough. The brain doesn't fully develop until 25. In fact, in one state recently, it may have been Tennessee, said, we're not going to allow transitions until 26. When your brain is fully developed and you're an adult and you want to do that, okay, that's on you. But we're not going to allow people to make an irreversible decision that could likely, they'll likely regret later. In fact, I mean, think about how many changes you've occurred in your life. Do you know there's something that goes on in life, and I think the older we get, we realize this. In fact, you don't even have to be that old. When you're 15, you probably look back at your 10-year-old self and said, you know, I was an idiot when I was 10, right? And then when you hit 20, you probably will look back at your 15-year-old self and you go, you know, I was an idiot when I was 15, right? And then when you hit 30, what do you do? You look back at your 20-year-old self and you go, I was an idiot when I was 20, right? Now, thankfully, this slows down later, right? You know, when you hit my age 61, I don't think I was an idiot when I was 50, but... The main point is, and Tim Keller makes this point, he says, do you realize what this means? No matter what age you are now, you're an idiot. <laughs> because you're going to get older and look back and go, I didn't have it all together then. Why? Because your heart and my heart continually changes, especially when we're young. So why would we encourage people to try and cement a particular characteristic when that heart's going to probably change and want something else in a few years. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, this has even been noticed by people who are atheists and people who are politically liberal, like Bill Maher. You know, Bill Maher, about a year ago, had this show on, Along for the Pride, where he pointed out how the early generations, the generations that were born much earlier, very few identify as LGBTQ. But as the generations go on, more and more people identify that. He says, by the time we hit 2060, we'll all be gay. <laughs> What's he pointing out? In fact, I remember him saying this. Why is this... He actually used Ohio when he said it. He said, why is this such a thing in California but not Ohio? It's a social media contagion. And he says, look, kids go through phases. He said, if everybody knew what they wanted to be when they were eight years old, the world would be filled with cowboys and princesses. He said, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a pirate. Thank God nobody took me seriously and took me for eye removal and peg leg surgery. 
This guy makes more sense now than most conservatives. He makes more sense than most pastors. Years ago, I was on his program. It used to be called Politically Incorrect. You remember that? In this sense, he is completely politically incorrect. God bless this atheist. Because he's telling the truth. And he's saying it in actually a funny way. Thomas Sowell, not so funny. Thomas Sowell is hitting our culture with both barrels. Here's what he said recently. Ours may become the first civilization destroyed not by the power of our enemies, but by the ignorance of our teachers and the dangerous nonsense they are teaching our children. In an age of artificial intelligence, they are creating artificial stupidity. So, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. All right, our final point. How do you find ultimate hope and identity? If you're not supposed to blindly follow your heart, how are you supposed to find your identity? Well, let's be honest about what our options are here. Do you realize that everyone you love will die? Everything you build will crumble. Everything you say will be forgotten. Everything you do will come to nothing. You and your identity will die and vanish unless God exists. And by the way, atheistic scientists will tell you the same thing. Do you know there's an actual a discipline in science now called eschatology? Just like Christians have eschatology, study of the end times. You know what scientists say is going to happen? We're going to go to heat death. Eventually, all the stars are going to burn out and everything's going to die. This is going to be true unless God exists. Now, as you know, normally when I come to a college campus, as we've done many times here at Ohio, the Ohio State University, we've gone through the evidence for Christianity called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It's a book we have out on the book table. I'm just going to assume that Christianity is true at this point. I haven't had time to defend it here today, but that's what we normally do when we go to a college campus. You can go to our YouTube channel and watch any of the presentations. Last week we were at Ball State and we were at Indiana Purdue University. Next week we'll be at Louisiana Christian and Louisiana Tech giving those kinds of presentations. But I just want to jump to the bottom line. What is the purpose of your life? According to Jesus, what is, why are you here? What should your identity be in? What is it? This is the interactive portion of the program. <laughs> why are we here? Whether you're a Christian or not, why are we here? Serve the Lord, why? We have a new assignment when we leave here. Know God and make him known. What does it mean to know God? Does it mean just into, well, you know, demons know that God exists. Not just to know that he exists, but to trust in him. In fact, Jesus is praying to the Father in John 17, and here's what he says. Now, this is eternal life that they, he's praying for us, meaning us, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. The purpose of life is to know God, and if you add the Great Commission in there, to make him known. Now, it's not just intellectual. I just mentioned the demons know that God exists. It's to trust in him. That's why we're here. And sometimes going into a relationship is going to cause pain and struggle and trouble. In fact, Jesus actually promises that, doesn't he? In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And Paul said, anyone who lives a faithful life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The question is, how do you know him? Remember I said that this is kind of the way that our culture thinks about who they are. Whatever you have on your heart, 
is you. That's the real you. Is that true? Well, there's a sense in which this is true. But it's not an idea you have. In Christianity, it's when you've accepted what Christ has done. You're not only forgiven, but you're given his righteousness. And when God sees you then, he actually only sees his perfect sacrifice. And that is your identity. Your identity is not something that's fleeting. Your identity is something that you can accept and have forever. Now, 1,990 years ago, right this hour, Jesus of Nazareth was standing before Caiaphas in a series of trials. And then he stood before Pilate and Herod. In fact, right now in Israel, it's about 1 a.m., maybe 2 a.m., 2.30, maybe 3.30. It's early in the morning. It was 1,990 years ago, 33 A.D., that the God of the universe added flesh to his humanity, came to earth, and then went through this so you could have a secure identity. Brace yourself for this. This is not going to be easy. Stop trying to achieve your identity. You don't achieve your identity. You receive your identity. If you have to achieve your identity, then all the pressure's on you. And there's always someone that can do it better. He went to the cross so you could receive your identity. You know, our culture says you have to put your identity in your political party or your sexual orientation or your gender identity or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your bank account or your vocation. Do you realize none of those things are ultimate? They're all going to vanish. 
they're not even going to last as long as you live, many of them. What happens if you lose your job? You have your identity in your job. What happens if you lose your job? You no longer have an identity? What happens if you lose your money, your bank account? You no longer have an identity? What happens if you have a sexual preference and at some point you can't sexually perform anymore or you're not sexually preferred yourself? You no longer have an identity? No, your identity is not in what you do. Your identity is in what you've accepted from your creator. He gives you the free will to reject him or the free will to accept him. And that identity means that as John said, all who did receive him to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become a child of God. Everyone's created by God, but only some people have become children of God because some people don't want the identity of Christ. That's okay. God will not force you into heaven against your will. If you don't want him now, you're not going to want him in eternity. By the way, this identity is secure. You know, you can lose your job, you can lose your money, you can lose your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your wife, you can lose your kids tragically, you can lose your sexual preference, your sexual ability, you're ultimately going to lose your life. There's only one thing you can't lose, and that's Jesus. You can't lose your identity in Him, it's secure. Has everyone in here accepted that identity? If not, why not? Why wouldn't you? It's free and it's secure and God came into time to offer it to you. So, who are you? You're made in the image of God. What is truth and love? Truth is what corresponds to reality. It's not your truth, it's not my truth, it's just the truth. What is love? Seeking what's best for the other person. And that doesn't mean approving what the other person necessarily wants to do. Should you follow your heart? No, you should guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. How do you find ultimate hope and identity? You accept what the Savior has done and you'll be secure and sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, this entire presentation is actually in a PowerPoint that I want to send you. All you need to do is text the word evidence to this phone number 855-909-0582. If you text the word evidence, I'm not going to only send you a variation of this presentation, but the entire I don't have enough faith to be an atheist presentation, which is like 360 slides. It's all going to be in a PDF format. Um, also, these books are available out on the book table, and all the proceeds from the sale of the books will go to feed needy children. Mine, okay? <laughs> Just so you know. Um, the Atheist book is out there, the, the seven-hour DVD set that goes through all of the evidence for, uh, from the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, in a summary format you can get. There's workbooks you can get with that on our website, curriculum that goes with it. This is the new book that my son and I just wrote, who's also a seminary grad, by the way, despite the fact that he's a major in the Air Force. It's called Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. All right. Uh, so let's go now to questions and or objections. And since no one likes to ask the first question, we're going to move right on to the second question. And we're going to have it right over here at the microphone. If you don't want to be on the internet, do not ask a question because you will be on the internet as soon as you get up to that microphone because the great Clint Bolin over here has cameras on you. And uh, you got to come up to the microphone because nobody will hear you out there in internet land if you don't. So who wants to uh, start out? Just go right up to the microphone there if you would, sir. And anyone that wants to ask after him, you don't need to wait. You can just get and line up behind him. That'll keep things moving. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, Micah. Micah? Micah. It's a prophet. Go ahead, Actually, sir. Um, I had a podcast, and actually came on the podcast like a few months ago. I really appreciate that. Oh, sure. Absolutely. This is the coolest yeah. thing to see you in person. So thank you. Oh, thanks for being here. Um, I had a question about um, conforming your life to Christ because there, there is an aspect of faith that is trust, right? And there is... Yeah conforming to and, and obedience mm -hmm. so if obedience and conforming to what he wants for our lives is something we do is that not an aspect of identity then that we have to pay attention to 
do you mean do works have anything to do with who we are as Christians? Is that sort of the question? Uh, I suppose so. I, I understand that it does not uh, draw me any closer to salvation, but if my identity comes from my faith in Christ and uh -huh. my faith in Christ is ma uh, manifest in my works, then are the things I do not also a part of who I am? Well, I would, in a certain sense, yes, but that's not the core of your identity. The core of your identity is that you've either accepted Christ and are now a child of God, or tragically, if you haven't, you're a child of wrath because we all deserve wrath because all of us have sinned. Look, there's only two things you can get, ultimately. You can either get grace or justice, and none of us want justice. Do you want justice? I don't want justice. If I got justice, I wouldn't like it. So, in a, in a certain sense, what you do might be an extension of the fact that you have a new identity in Christ. Just like if you don't have an identity in Christ, the certain things you do might be an extension of that identity. But the core of your identity is the fact that you're a child of God, that you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, that you are now a child of that's going to get grace rather mm -hmm. than wrath. I, I, I look to like... Um in Romans when he says, mm -hmm. be transformed by the renewing of your mm -hmm. mind, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that, that transformation process um, it, it is granted to me, but it also includes a, a walking step-by-step -step after Christ. Oh, now you're talking about sanctification. I see what yes, you're saying yes. now. Yes, when you're, when you're being sanctified and you're becoming more and more like Jesus, that's the intent anyway, mm -hmm. then yes, your identity is becoming more and more like Christ. And it's interesting that I think the writer of Hebrews says that Christ learned obedience through suffering. And he didn't have a sin nature. He never sinned, and yet he learned obedience through suffering. If Jesus learns obedience through suffering, do you think we might learn from it too? Yeah. So yes, in the sanctification process, hopefully your uh, behavior is becoming more and more like Jesus as a result of the fact that you've identified with him. Okay. Thank you very All much. Right. Appreciate hey, your time. Thanks, Micah. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. What's your name? Connor. Tommy, go ahead, sir. Connor, sorry. Oh, say again? Connor. Connor, okay. Yeah. So, I'm a college student, and mm -hmm. I'm secure knowing my identity is in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And obviously, in the college world today, there's like an identity search, like you were saying. Sure. And people are always looking for one thing to mm -hmm. fill that void. Mm -hmm. So, what would you say is the best way to um, share share Jesus with non-believing college roommates or teammates, you know? What I'm saying is help them find out their identity. These are people that are struggling with their identity, you're saying, and you yeah. recognize that. Yeah, like my friends okay. and roommates. Maybe you just have a conversation. Uh, maybe I would ask them, do you think it's a good idea to follow your heart without moral restraint? And see what they say. And then you can talk about how our hearts are deceitful and selfish. And everybody knows this, that our hearts are... Uh, conflicting, and that our hearts are also changing. So how could we, even if we wanted to, our hearts, we'd, we'd be changing our identity every 10 minutes. And a lot of people do that, don't they? Yeah. So it might be just to have a conversation about what their innermost thoughts are on this idea of following your heart and see where it goes. And then, you know, it depends on who you're talking to, quite obviously, because not every conversation is going to go the same way with every person because it depends on what they believe and where they're coming from. One question, as you might know, I always ask people is if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Because many of the people I ask that to hesitate or say no because they don't want God to exist. They want to be God of their own lives. They're not on a truth quest or on a happiness quest and they're just going to believe whatever they think is going to make them happy. So that's, I, you, you can save yourself a lot of time by starting with that question, yeah. right? If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If you want to customize that question because people have a negative connotation of Christianity, you might say, if Jesus really did rise from the dead 1,990 years ago Sunday, if he really did that to prove he was God, would you follow him? See what they say. Again, if they hesitate or say no, it's not a head problem, it's a heart problem. It doesn't matter how much how much evidence you give them, they're not going to believe. They don't want to believe. In fact, let me just ask a question of the audience in here uh, just for a second. 
Can everybody in here, this is just for the Christians, okay? If you're not a Christian, it's not a question for you, just for the Christians. Christians in here. I want you to think of somebody that uh, you know who's not a Christian whom you'd like to be a Christian. Friend, relative, somebody like that. Everybody got someone? Okay, don't point at them. Um, Okay, is the person you're thinking of right now on a relentless pursuit of truth? They want to know if Christianity is true. Or are they apathetic or maybe even hostile to Christianity? How many people say the person I'm thinking of right now is on a relentless pursuit of truth? They want to know if Christianity is true. Let me see your hands, please. Two hands. How many people say the person I'm thinking of is apathetic or hostile? Yeah, look around the room. It's always either 100 to 0 or 99 to 1. So we got here 99 to 1. Most people are looking for God like a criminal's looking for a cop. <laughs> They're running. They don't want God to exist because they want to be God of their own lives. And Christians, can we be honest? Half the time we want to be God of our own lives too, don't we? We'll suppress the truth to go our own way, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a hard issue, Connor, but I found that that question can cut right to the chase. Now, suppose you get somebody who says, no, I wouldn't become a Christian. What can you do with that person? I think there are four things, maybe more. I'm just the four things I think of, and this is a different skill set than giving people answers. The first thing you can do is pray, right? You can grow by doing this. Second thing you can do is plant seeds every now and then. Maybe plant seeds that get them to doubt their worldview or plant seeds that get them to realize that Christianity is true and good and right and beautiful. The third thing you can do is love them, which doesn't mean that you approve of everything they do, as we just mentioned, right? And the fourth thing you can do is wait. Why wait? Because if that person's ever going to be interested, it'll probably be when tragedy strikes. And tragedy strikes everyone at some point. When tragedy strikes, that person's not going to call their atheist friend. What's the atheist going to say? Well, there's no rhyme or reason to any of this. This stuff just happens. No, they're going to call a person of spiritual depth, you. When the student's ready, the teacher will appear, right? So make sure that you pray. Make sure that you plant seeds. Make sure that you love them. And then just wait. Because, I mean, for those of you who are Christians in here, were you always a Christian? There was a period you didn't care either, right? There was a period you maybe were on the run as well. So why do you expect everybody to agree with you now? You didn't agree with you 10 years ago, did you? I didn't agree with myself 40 years ago. Why do you think everyone should be exactly where you are when it comes to spiritual development? They shouldn't be. So just be patient. And I'm not very patient. I've been praying for patience for quite a while, and frankly, I'm getting tired of waiting for it. <laughs> All, right? All right? Does that make sense, Con? Yes, sir. Thank right. you. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. What's your name? I'm Logan. Logan, go ahead. So I have a professor who's an atheist, and we were talking after class mm-hmm. about a month ago, mm-hmm. and he was like, you're only a Christian because you were born in the United States because okay. your parents are Christians. He said if you were born in like Pakistan, I'd be a Muslim, if I was born in uh, India, I'd be a Hindu. And okay. I just didn't know what I should say to him. Or um, I would ask him, do you consider this uh, a Christian nation? I mean, you were brought up in largely a Christian nation, right? Yeah. So why are you an atheist? <laughs> That's what I would ask him. Mm-hmm. I'd also say, you, just because some people may tend to believe what their culture believes, does that determine right and wrong? No. It might be true that if I was in Saudi Arabia, I'd be a Muslim, but that doesn't necessarily mean Islam's true, nor does it mean that Christianity's true if I grow up here in America and become a Christian. What's true is not what other people believe. What's true is whatever the evidence leads you to. This is why people um, will sometimes say, well, you know, well, let me put it another way. So, some, sometimes I come to campuses and I, I meet somebody who say, that, you know, I used to be a Christian, but now I'm an atheist now because I lost my faith. Do you know what I want to say to them? Mm-hmm. What I want to say is, so? Are you telling me because your psychology changed that God has somehow popped out of existence? 
that because your psychology changed, Jesus hasn't risen from the dead and all the evidence that shows that he did is now somehow, somehow bad? No, your psychology will not tell you the truth about whether or not Christianity is true or anything else outside your skull. What will tell you what's true is the evidence. And just because a lot of people don't care about the evidence or look at the evidence doesn't mean it isn't there. It's there. You can evaluate it. In fact, Christianity is a worldview. You can actually evaluate and discover whether or not it's true. That's why the Apostle Paul says, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, your faith is in vain. We are to be all men most pitied if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead. In fact, if you think about this, there's really only two facts you need to establish to show that Christianity is true. God existing and Jesus rising from the dead. If those two things are true, if God exists and Jesus rose from the dead, everything else falls into place. Christianity is true. If either of those are false, Christianity is false. doesn't matter what you believe about it. It's false. So what he is talking about, your, um, your professor is talking about how people tend to follow their culture. Okay, so what? That doesn't determine right or wrong or true or false. It just shows that people uncritically sometimes just follow whatever their culture follows. But he didn't follow his culture because he's an atheist, right? In fact, Richard Dawkins, the great atheist, made that point one time, the exact same point. And yet, I, I, it seems to be lost on Dr. Dawkins that he was brought up in a Christian nation with an official church, and he's an atheist. Why? Because he decided to be an atheist. He bucked his culture at the time. Nowadays, you go over to the UK and you're bucking your culture if you're a Christian. In fact, just this week, what's today? Today's Thursday. Tomorrow, we have an interview with Calvin Robinson. You guys know Calvin Robinson? Is Father Calvin Robinson, the guy that went to the student union at Oxford just a couple of months ago and pointed out that the church ought not bless same-sex unions just because of the scriptures? He's not talking about same-sex marriage in government. He's talking about it because the Church of England wants to now bless same-sex unions. And Calvin Robinson just blistered them and said, look, if you're going to be a Christian, why, why aren't you obeying the Bible, basically? Uh, so he's a bright light in a dark place because he's standing for the truth. And we've got to do the same. We've got to stand for the truth. Uh, in fact, one of the most interesting comments on his... A speech, someone here in the U.S. actually took his 12-minute speech and put, got it down to five minutes because people can't watch 12 minutes. That's too long. <laughs> anyway, so all the highlights in five minutes. One of the top comments, believe it or not, was from a Muslim. And the guy said, I'm a Muslim, and it's refreshing to see a Christian standing for what he believes. What an indictment on Christians that a Muslim has to say. Do you know what Islam gets right? Islam gets right that God is a judge. They're right about that. If God isn't a judge, he's not loving. You have to judge sin if you're loving. You have to right wrongs if you're loving. What we get right here is God is love, but sometimes we misdefine what love is. Love isn't do whatever you want. God sets the boundaries as to what love is. So I would point out that it's not... It's not the culture that decides what's right and wrong. It's the evidence, and you've got to look at the evidence to discover really what is true. All right? Awesome. Thank Thanks, you very Logan. much. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. What's your uh, name? Jeremiah. Jeremiah, go ahead, sir. We uh, got all so prophets today. You notice that? <laughs> hey, Micah, Jeremiah. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, uh, I started a business a couple years ago, and I run a ministry through it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions on my mind throughout this was the question of, you know, I put a lot of my identity and investment into this. And mm -hmm. if for some reason it's to fall away, what am I supposed to do after it? But that last slide just answered that up for me. And that was really cool. So my buddy sent me a question. So I figured I'd ask that instead. Okay. Um, Asking for a friend. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So he said, how do you engage with someone whose identity is deeply rooted in their sexuality he has a friend who's gay who has a boyfriend, and they're both very well aware of each other's beliefs, mm -hmm. um, but he doesn't know what to do further with that. Let me point out that, in fact, I'm t I was just talking to the lady I mentioned earlier at our house today. She was visiting my wife. She's on our board, the lady that works at Starbucks. She said every one of the four young transitioners have had brutal um, upbringings. 
One girl was raped by her grandfather. Another young man trying to transition to become a woman was pretty much rejected by his father and was made fun of by Christians. You may think it's stupid. You may think it's wrong. But you shouldn't mock people. You shouldn't belittle them. They're struggling. In fact, a friend of mine who's a mega pastor, you would know his name if I told it to you. This is his, what he said, just his experience. He said, I've never met a lesbian who wasn't sexually abused. And he's counseled a lot of them. So people don't just randomly say, um, at least older people don't randomly say, um, I just decided to be gay. There's something that happened in their lives normally. And so you have to try and prayerfully see if you can help them address that and approve of them as a person because they're made in the image of God and valuable just like anybody else. Christ died for everyone. So just because you may disagree on their behavior and what they're doing doesn't mean you can't love them. In fact, to love them, you have to disagree with what they're doing. So I think you need to take a soft approach and try and befriend them. My friend befriends these young girls all the time, and even there's a guy doing this. And Now one of them's doing a Bible study with her. In fact, her parents said, you can't have a Bible in this house. And now my friend is actually about to do a Bible study with this transitioning woman because she befriended her. So just befriend these people. Invite them over. Strike up a relationship. See if you can be of help. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank All you. Right. All right, thank you. Yes, sir, what's your name? Hey, I'm Deva. Nice to meet you. Uh, my question is, is about evil. Yes. Uh, when people ask you why there's evil, and then you respond with uh, that God allows it, and mm -hmm. then later he brings good from it. Mm -hmm. My question is, where do you uh, see that in the Bible? Because when I go to Bible study or listen to sermon, the pastors have been told that it's usually there's evil because of grandfathers and ancestors who have done something bad, and there's that's why the evil or the sin or the evil mostly like like cancer or whatever like falls to it there's but some you, kind of curse you're saying That's yeah yeah yeah, saying. yeah yeah exactly curse okay well i would have to see the scriptures they're using for that it's true that some of the consequences of evil may visit the second and third generation if i'm an alcoholic my kids are going to suffer okay if i abuse uh -huh. my kids they're going to suffer that's just the natural consequences of sin right yeah so, yes, that's true. But, but where do you see, when you say uh, that God brings good from yes. evil, where do you, in text, do you see that? Well, in I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example in the scriptures. Okay. Okay. In the Old Testament now, uh, Judah is the fourth son from Jacob. And the story goes that Jacob had 12 sons, and his favorite son was Joseph, because Joseph was born to Rachel, his favorite wife. And at one point, after Jacob had given Joseph his colored robe and basically made him the star son, the other brothers were jealous of him and said, we should kill him. He's dad's favorite. And they said, actually wouldn't make any sense to kill him. Why don't we make some money off him and sell him into slavery? And Judah sold his brother into slavery to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Now, Judah was, is in the bloodline of the Messiah, the tribe of Judah. That's where Jesus comes from. This is another reason why the Bible is not made up. You would never put this shady guy as... <laughs> in the bloodline of the Messiah, but he is. A bunch of other shady people, too, but I don't have time for that. Anyway, so as you know, Joseph goes to Egypt. 
He's treated horribly. He's falsely accused of a, a crime. He's thrown into prison. And then he eventually works his way out of that. And then he becomes, I think, the third highest administrator in Egypt. And he sets a whole bunch of grain aside in case there's a famine. And then there is a famine in Israel. And his whole family, including Jacob and all his brothers, come to Egypt to escape the famine. And Joseph recognizes them. And you remember what he says to him when he recognizes them? He says, you dirty rats, you're going to pay for what you did to me. No, he doesn't say that. He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, the saving of many lives. In other words, this is known as the ripple effect, that mm -hmm. every event that occurs in life ripples forward to affect trillions of other events. Most of the time, we don't see the ripple effect. But in this case, we can see it. The very people that did evil, Judah and his brothers, had a ripple effect go forward that helped them later. Most of the time, you don't see the ripple effect. This is, by the way, why you can trust God when inexplicable evil comes into your life. So are you making that conclusion based on that story, or is it like throughout That's the That's only an example of it. The doctrine of it comes from other places, including Romans chapter 8. Okay. Which says that we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Notice he doesn't say all things are good. All things work together for good. Okay. And then it goes on, he says, to conform to the image of his son. Remember we just talked about how sometimes that suffering can help you be more obedient. It helped Jesus. Sometimes mm -hmm. going through difficulty and suffering and trial can do the same thing. To conform to the image of his son. So that's one place you can get the doctrine for it. Another place you can get the doctrine for it is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where Paul is ending a period where he's or ending a section where he's talking about suffering. He ends it this way. He says, For our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us a greater weight of glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, for what is seen is temporary. We fix our eyes on what is unseen, for what is unseen is eternal. In other words, you have to have an eternal perspective. You may not be able to make sense of this life just from the temporary. But all of this goes into eternity. All right. So there's always a ripple effect. For good or bad, there's always a ripple effect. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes, sir. What's your name? My name is Virgil. Virgil. Go ahead, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, when we submit to uh, Christ's identity, mm -hmm. do we lose our uniqueness as individuals? Um, how do we keep our, do we keep our individuality when we uh, accept Christ's identity? Oh, of course we do, in the sense that God uses all sorts of different personalities. I mean, look at the different personalities between the apostles. Let's just say Peter and Paul. Two different personalities, right? Mm -hmm. Paul is what we would call a direct, demanding, decisive, dictatorial, dogmatic doer. For those of you who know the DISC personality profile, he's the D, right? Let's get everything done, do it now. I want this yesterday. Peter is the... The fun one, the, the, the influencer one, the man that speaks and thinks later, right? But God used both of them. Peter was the backslapper. Peter was the fun one. Peter was the one that was easily pulled away by the Judaizers that Paul rebukes in the, in the second chapter of Galatians. Probably his earliest writing is to Galatians. And in the second chapter of Galatians, Paul says, I told Peter to his face that he was wrong for trying to get the New Testament believers to obey the Old Testament law. Here is one apostle dope slapping another apostle in the Bible. Now, this is another embarrassing detail they never would have made up, right? Why is one apostle correcting another apostle in the Bible? Because that's just the way it happened. So they have different personalities. John is probably the soft, sweet guy. Uh, you know, the emperor said, we're not going to kill him. He's too nice a guy. Let's put him on Patmos, right? <laughs> Thomas is the analytical one. I won't believe until I see, you know, I put my hands in his side, put my hands in his hands, put my hands in his side, that kind of thing. So God uses all different personalities. So yeah, you don't lose your personality. In fact, before Paul, when his name was Saul, before he became a Christian, he was a dictatorial, dogmatic, defiant doer. 
After he became a Christian, he was a dictatorial, dogmatic, defiant doer. But he was just directed in a different direction. God can use your personality, whatever it is, just as long as you're pointing in the right direction. So, yeah, you, you maintain your personality. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Now, hopefully some of the rough edges are, are shaved off that. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, my name is David. Uh, I thank my mom for taking me here. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Let's thank Mom over there. There's Mom. <laughs> thank you, Mom. <laughs> Hey, moms don't get enough credit, right? All right, yes. Uh, yes, sir. So I have a lot of friends who are Christian, but they're progressive Christian, basically. Okay. And usually I try to talk to them about the Bible and stuff, and there's like usually two arguments they have. The first one is where they usually say that, oh, it's mistranslated. It's not man shall not sleep with man, it's man shall not sleep with boy. And uh -huh. then some even believe that it's homosexuality is a sin, but they'll say that, it doesn't matter if they live that lifestyle because as long as they believe in Jesus, as long as they repent and have faith that they'll go to heaven, they'll still go to heaven. So, mm -hmm. yeah, those are the two arguments that they usually have. Mm -hmm. I just want to know your preference. Yeah, okay, point. great question. Um, first of all, when somebody says something, it's not their job. It's not your job to refute what they say. It's their job to support what they say, right? Yeah. So uh, if he's trying to say, your friend is trying to say, well, it's mistranslated, I first question would be, what do you mean by it's mistranslated? What is the proper translation? And then how did you come to that conclusion? What evidence do you have for that position? Because I can tell you that if you look at Romans chapter 1, he's talking about the act of same-sex behavior. And in ancient times, same-sex behavior in the first century was considered immoral just like it was considered immoral among Christians or Jews prior to that, okay? So it's the behavior itself. It's not the orientation. It's yeah. not, well, I have this yeah. feeling, okay? If that were the case, having the feeling of uh, heterosexual relationships would be sinful too because you can use that illicitly as well, okay? It's the action. And so the acts themselves were condemned as indecent, according to Romans 1. I don't care how you translate it. You can translate it any way you want, as long as you understand that the original meant indecent acts. Okay? Yes. And then the second part that he mentioned is that you can live however you want and you'll still be saved. Not according to Paul. In fact, if you look at, uh, not according to Jesus either. If you look at Rome, uh, Romans chapter 6, Paul says, well, if we're saved by grace, shouldn't we sin all the more so grace will abound? And Paul says, may it never be. And then when he's dealing with a problem in the church at Corinth, there's a man at the church at Corinth, which was the Las Vegas of the ancient world, who was actually sleeping with his father's wife, his stepmother. And he was proud of it. He said, I'm doing this. And Paul said, expel the immoral brother from your congregation. Expel him. Satan maybe will teach him a lesson. I think he says something like that. And then the idea was if you expel him, hopefully he's going to come to his senses and he can be restored later. What does all this mean? It means this. Every single person is welcome in the church. There's only one person who's not welcome. Someone who claims to be a Christian and says that known sin isn't really sin. Paul says, expel the immoral brother. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you don't love Jesus and you're not keeping his commandments, are you saved? No, you're not saved because you're keeping his commandments. Keeping his commandments is evidence that you are saved. You see the point? Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah. In fact, Jesus even says, there's going to be some of you who are going to say, Oh, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name and that in your name? Away from me. I never knew you. So uh, good works are evidence you're saved. They're not the cause of your salvation. They're the result of your salvation. As Martin Luther famously said, you're saved by faith alone, but your faith is not alone. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, where he says you're saved not by works, but by grace through faith. In the next couple of verses, he says, you were prepared to do good works. So you don't, if Jesus 
Jesus is your savior if he's also your Lord. If he's just, oh, I, I got fire insurance and I'm going to go do whatever I want, that doesn't demonstrate you're truly saved. Yes. All okay. right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Excellent you. questions. Thank you. And thank you, Mom. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello. Uh, my name is Daryl Mayo. Hey, Daryl. Um, my question is going to end up being, when do you know it's time to leave your home church? Hmm. And the, the reason that I'm asking is... Um, I attend a Nazarene church. I've been going there. I'm 50, 52 years old. I was saved and baptized when I was 10. Uh -huh. I've been going to this church um, along with my family, my mom and dad, since, you know, for like 30 years. Okay. Um, it's a Nazarene church. I really didn't start studying the Bible and really getting into what I, what I consider a deep relationship with Jesus until about six years ago. Okay. Um, I have to be careful because now that I'm in this relationship with Jesus every day, all day, and I love him so much, I just don't understand why everybody else isn't where I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have to restrain myself a mm -hmm. lot. Um, and part of that is, you know, now I'm in church, I'm really getting to understand a lot of things in the Bible that I don't agree with in a Nazarene church. And I, I actually went to uh, lunch with my pastor who said he doesn't believe in the rapture, and I was like, what? Okay, hold what on. What did you hold say? On. Let's, let's, let's see if we can... Right, I, I just, I want to know... Get to, okay, I would say, Daryl, that eschatology is not an essential of the faith unless you're denying Jesus is going to come back. Okay. Because there's a lot of different viewpoints on how or when Jesus is going to come back. Mm -hmm. But the preterists, those that say... All that happened in the first century and Jesus is not coming back, that would be considered a heresy. But whether you believe in pre-trib, post-trib, whatever, rapture, no rapture, that's, that's a secondary issue that Christians can, can disagree with. I mean, people always ask me what my view of eschatology is, and I always say, look, I'm not on the planning committee. I'm just on the welcoming committee. Right, right, right. Okay? <laughs> So when he comes back, he comes back. I know he's going to come as a thief in the night. No one exactly knows the, the time or the hour, the days or the season. So we'll just wait and always be ready. And I think God intended it to be ambiguous. Why? Because if we knew he was coming back in, say, 2034, is that going to change our behavior probably in a bad way? Yeah. It's better to have this imminence to it that he could come at any minute. Thank you for that. And then right. your views on entire sanctification yeah. with the Nazarene church is one of the other things that I, I struggle with because I don't feel in this life anyway that's possible until you know I am in heaven with Jesus. Then you can become entirely well, sanctified. Actually, I've achieved it. You know, I wrote a new book. <laughs> it's very humble of me. The book is called 10 Steps Humility and How I Made It in Seven. Okay. <laughs> Which is really humble to me because I actually made it in six. All right. All right. No, I agree with you that given our sin nature, I don't think it's ever going to be eradicated this side of the grave. But that's, that's basically Wesleyanism, that, it, that you can be perfect at some point. Right. And I would just point out that if, if, you, uh, if someone believed that and you were to kick them in their shins and take their iPhone, mm -hmm. they would probably do something very bad. Okay. Right, right. So you can nudge them a little bit, and that sin nature is going to come out. But am I going to split over some guy who believes that? I, I don't think so. I don't. I, I would. I would. I would split with people over the true essentials of the faith. There is a God. You are not him. Jesus came and rose from the dead, and he is God, the second person of the eternal Trinity. And by trusting in him, you can not only have your sins forgiven, but you've been given his righteousness. These kind of essentials, not, you know, eschatology or mode of baptism or color of the carpet or any of that stuff. Okay. And then do, would, do you feel that it would be pertinent, just if you're in a church and just, and I love the people in my church. Mm -hmm. I really do. I mean, mm -hmm. we've got a, a lot of great relationships there, but it's just a point where I just don't feel like I'm getting as much out of it. And I, I don't know. I'm just, I feel like... I, well, it might be that you're further down the road than many people, but what you can do is turn that around and then become a servant and maybe teach if you have the ability to teach or lead a small group or something. I just started doing that there. Okay, yep. well, there you go. Because actually the purpose of the church is not for us to consume and be fed all the time. The purpose of the church is to equip the saints to do ministry. 
That's what Ephesians 4 says. So the pastor isn't supposed to be doing all the ministry. He and his team are supposed to be equipping the saints to do the ministry. And one of the problems I think we have in America is we bought into the, the idea that church is primarily for unbelievers. Right. That's what we do. We bring people into the church to try and convince them to become Christians. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying to convince people in the church to become Christians, but if that's your focus and it's not making disciples and equipping the saints to do ministry, we've lost the main purpose of the church. Okay. Yeah, it makes perfect All sense. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Daryl. Yes, sir. Hi, my name's Drew. Drew, yes, sir. Can you do something about this? Um, well, I'm glad you have the gift of humbleness because I, I, for pausing you for a second, I, I thought David's mom and I were going to be buds because my favorite son's named David, too. Okay. All right. But he stole my question almost word for word, so mm -hmm. I don't know. But thank, you know, thank God you don't have the gift of brevity, so uh -huh. I can think of another one. Um, <laughs> my... My oldest son, David, is gay. We're about out of time. Okay. <laughs> and Go ahead. we've had some great conversations. Uh -huh. he, he's asked me some great questions. Mm -hmm. One of his really interesting questions was, so, Dad, let's say I find a man who I love and we're, we try and be good moral people and blah, blah, blah. Stop. Good, Stop. Good people. I know. Stop. Stop. What does good moral people mean? Can I finish the question? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm, what I'm talking to him, as soon as he starts bringing up a moral standard, yeah. you need to say, where are you getting this moral standard from? And why do you think that's the purpose of life, to be good moral people? Where does yeah. this come from? No, that's a good answer. Should have thought of that. But um, so I definitely will ask him that again. But he says he's done some research, and Barna does good research and uh -huh. finds that about 30 percent, maybe even a third of ministers struggle uh -huh. with pornography yeah. regularly. Probably true. And so yeah. it could be more. Those yeah. are the ones who admit it. You're right. So he says, what if I have this loving relationship and maybe we have sex once a week, which is sinful. He's read the Bible too. And, and someone who's a follower of Christ looks at pornography once a week. What's the difference? They're both sinful and they both should want to stop doing that. The problem is, as I see it, is that I don't think any pastor is going to get up and say pornography is a good thing and you ought to do it. But I do see some pastors now saying that same-sex relationships ought to be blessed by the church and by God. For example, the Church of England is now saying that, and that's why Calvin Robinson got up and gave that great speech to counterpoint that. So we're all sinners. Everybody or no one's going to make it to, to heaven without Jesus. So um, pointing out that, oh, well, what about this sin? Okay, yeah, that's another sin that's going to keep you out of the kingdom. You know, homosexuality isn't the one thing that's going to keep you out of heaven because even if you do engage in homosexual acts, you've done other evil things too, right? Just like heterosexuality isn't going to get you into heaven. Because whether you're homosexual or heterosexual in your identity, with you, your claimed identity, you've done evil elsewhere. So why don't we just talk about good and evil to begin with? And how are you going to have the evil that you've done atoned for? Do you want grace or do you want justice in the afterlife? Mm, that's good. So, and I did have a bone to pick with you because my wife asked me, you know, or told me, actually mm -hmm. didn't ask me a thing. She told me I was an idiot. And you just, you just said the question. I asked her, how'd you come to that conclusion? You told us to ask that. I told husbands, never use those questions with your uh, wife. You know that, Drew. All right. Because if I ask my wife, if she says you're an idiot, and I say, how'd you come to that conclusion? She's going to have a list 37 years long. I was just trying to be a good follower of Frank. Yeah, well. I must have, must have missed a meeting, I guess. That's you must have, Drew. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your question, brother. Our first young lady. Yes, ma'am, what's your name? Uh, I'm Susie. Susie, go ahead. Yep. Uh, we identify the embryos as humans, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is about IVF treatment for infertile couples. The question is, is discarding the excess frozen embryos after having one desired baby through IVF for a couple within a marriage 
is right or evil in the sight of God. I'm sorry, it's wrong. It is. You're creating embryos to discard them? Okay, what if the doctor says it's the only treatment you have to go through to become pregnant? Doctor's not God. So should I be childless for my entire life in the plan of God? There's adoption. There's praying I can't, for... I can't adopt in this country. What's that, ma'am? I can't adopt in this country. Well, I'm, I wish I could tell you what you want to hear. Yep. But I can't. So I, I don't think creating embryos and discarding them is ethical, is moral. Now, obviously, there's nothing about this in the Bible because this is a new technology. But um, once a, an egg and a sperm come together and an ovum is created, that's a human being that has begun to develop. And it, it's not something I think we, we ought to do. Now, if there's a way to do it without discarding embryos, then go right ahead. Yeah, make one and implant it. But they right? harvest 12 to 15 eggs, they make eight to nine embryos, and then they send just one and discard the rest. Yeah, it's painful. That's the treatment. I know, I know that's the treatment. I, I just don't think that's something we ought to be doing. I mean, it, it would be an ends justify the means, wouldn't it? Okay, thank you, sir. And I got I know, the answer. I know it's a hard, hard answer, Susie. I'm sorry. I wish I could. Yeah, I'm a born again Christian, and uh, uh, I'm dealing uh, with this from a long time. Me and my husband, according to Psalms 139 or Jeremiah 1, yes, uh, we have been asking God. Yes, we'll keep asking. Mentors, yeah. Miracles do occur, as you know. Yeah, but God gave us the peace and comfort. But I just want to know your thoughts about this. Well, well, thank you for wanting to have children because too many people don't want to have them <laughs> in our country. And that's tragic. Oh. We're here to do that. Maybe God will do a miracle in this case. Just keep praying. Amen. Thank you so Amen. much. Amen. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, Cain. Cain? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. So uh, I have a friend who believes like Christianity is like a white man religion. Uh huh. Just based on like what Europeans have done with like slavery and like colonization over history. So my uh -huh. question was like, how can I go against like this logic or thinking? Well, I would ask him, does he think Jesus was white? <laughs> okay. <Yeah>, for sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> right, he wasn't. He wasn't Jim Caviezel. He was Semitic. So he wasn't white or black, he was Semitic, but he represented the entire human race. Hmm. And he can save, as the scriptures say, there's going to be people from every tribe and tongue in heaven. So it's not a white man's religion. It's For not sure. a black man's religion. It's not a Hindu. It's just, it's a human race religion. Yes, Does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right. All right. Thank you. Hey, great question. Thank you. Uh, hello, sir. Um, yes, sir. What's your name? Plametti. Um, Say again. Plametti. Plametti. Go yes, ahead. sir. Um, I have a friend who was Christian, mm -hmm. but he's now looking into Islam. Oh, yep. well, what can I do to bring him back, like towards Jesus? Lock him up. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would ask him why does he think Islam's true. Well, I've asked him that already. What does he say? He he's not really the type of guy to like. He doesn't have a straightforward answer. He's just doing it because most of our friends are Muslims and stuff. And oh, so it's more, he takes what we would call a functional view of religion rather than a, a true or false view of religion. Yes. This religion works for me, so I'm going to believe it. Yes. Right? Uh, the problem is there's a lot of things that work that aren't true. Right? Lying works. Does that mean we ought to do it? No. Cheating, stealing, you know, just many things that work might work for us at least temporarily, but we're not supposed to do it. And if Christianity is indeed true, by the way, this is true of Islam. If Islam is true, then Christians are in trouble, right? Yes. Because Surah 5, verse 30-something in the Quran says, anyone who's not a Christian, verse 33 says, 
will, will be in hellfire. Anyone who's not a Muslim, I should say. Anyone who's not a Muslim will be in hellfire. So if either Christianity or Islam is true, then our eternity is dependent on whether or not we become a Muslim or become a Christian. And so it seems to me eternity is a lot more important than right now. Right? I mean, you're going to be dead a lot longer than you're going to be alive. So it might be important to really discover whether Islam is true or whether Christianity is true or whether neither are true. Right? That's yes. possible. Neither are true. I think if he takes a fair look at the evidence, though, he's going to realize that Christianity is indeed true and not Islam. Not that everything Islam teaches is false. A lot of what they teach is true. They teach there's a God. They teach you ought to pray. They teach you ought to give 2.5% of your income, just like Christians believe. <laughs> they teach all those things. Um, but when it comes to Jesus and whether or not he rose from the dead, Islam doesn't have it right. In fact, Islam asks us to believe what a book says written 600 years after the events by people who were not there rather than believe the eyewitnesses who wrote the New Testament down regarding what happened to Jesus. Why should we take docu a document written by one person, apparently, 600 years later, then believe the documents that were written by eyewitnesses who were Jewish and didn't think a man could claim to be God and rise from the dead and actually paid with their lives for saying he rose from the dead. Why wouldn't we trust what they said rather than what the Quran says? So I would, um, I would try and ask him uh, if he knows what both Islam and Christianity teaches about the afterlife and then point out that eternity is very important and you ought to avail yourself of the evidence to see which is true because your eternity depends on it. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right, great Thank question. You. Thank you. And thanks for being concerned about your friend and then lock him up. Sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? Philip. Philip, go ahead, sir. Um, just want to thank you, mm -hmm. first of all, for being here tonight and uh, using your God-given talents to create ripples for Christ right in Columbus, Ohio. Everybody does that, by the way. You're all doing it, too. Everybody yeah. creates ripples. If you're a Christian, even if you're not a Christian, you create ripples for Christ, believe it or not. But anyway, yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Tonight's talk comes at a really good time for me personally and my life group at church because we're in the early stages of planning an event um, around... Um, understanding and articulating what our purpose is mm -hmm. and um, we're, we're going to have an outside speaker we're going to go through some activities and at the end of the night I think the the takeaway for anyone who attends the event will be um, kind of a succinct short written mm -hmm. piece of what their purpose or what their life mission is mm -hmm. and I'm just really curious for Frank Turek if he in uh, you know, a, a few short sentences could articulate for us, I'm really interested because I've been a fan of yours for a long time, what's your purpose, what's your personal mission statement? Well, my purpose is to teach the, the truth that Christianity is true, teach the evidence that Christianity is true. That's what my primary focus is. It's what we do at crossexamine.org. We say we present evidence that Christianity is true and we cross-examine ideas against it. So I've always, I came to faith through apologetics, and when I met Norman Geisler, who at the time was the Michael Jordan of apologetics, and I started to learn from him, I was able to follow what my desire was. I was able to follow my heart. <laughs> I, hey, sometimes following your heart is correct if it's within the right moral constraints, right? If it's something that God has placed there and is consistent with what God wants you to do, then it could be a good thing, but too, too often we see people following their heart into evil. In any event, so I came to faith through apologetics and was interested in pursuing it once I got out of the Navy, and that's, I had that opportunity with Dr. Norman Geisler. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Before we go to the next question, I want to ask you guys a favor, if you would. This is the first time we've done this presentation, particularly here on a college campus. So I want to ask you if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us some feedback on it. And the way you can do that is um, 
The way you can do that is to text the word event to this phone number. And what it's going to do is send you a text back and ask you like two or three questions. That's all. So if you don't mind doing that, that'll help us. All right. Uh, anyone else? And by the way, those watching out on internet land, you can do the same thing. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Wyatt. Wyatt, go ahead, sir. Uh, I have a question about your, uh, at the beginning of like how we are made. Uh, uh -huh. We're made in the image of God. Uh -huh. uh, do you think it's possible that God could have created the laws of evolution in that we were made two, what, however many years ago. Mm -hmm. We were made human like we are today, mm -hmm. but maybe in other species of animals or whatever that evolution could be realistic. Is that possible? Of course it's possible. Yeah, God can do whatever he wants to bring us. He can use an evolutionary process or create us instantaneously. I think the evidence shows is he created us instantaneously. Not that there isn't microevolution that has ha happened since then. There is. But macroevolution from the goo to you via the zoo, I don't see that. In fact, I see evidence against that. But even if that was true, the laws that drive it would be driven by a mind like God. So even if macroevolution were true... But the laws that God created to get us here did that, it would still require God. So either way, I just don't see evidence that macroevolution is true. Not good evidence. I see too much counter evidence against it. In fact, I'll just give you four real quickly, just by the acronym LIFE, L-I-F-E. L stands for limited, limited genetic change. Do you realize that when we try and breed dogs, we can get dogs as small as a Chihuahua or as large as a Great Dane, right? But what, what can't we do? We can't break the genus of dogs. We can't turn dogs into cats or anything else, right? Here we are using all of our intelligence and we reach genetic limits. Why do we think a non-intelligent process can break those genetic limits? In fact, this is even true that, uh, I think it's uh, Dr. Richard Lenski, I wanna say he was at Penn State, did, um, did some research on E. coli bacteria. And E. coli bacteria's lifespan is so short that it would be equivalent, the experiments he did on E. coli bacteria would be equivalent to a million years of, of, uh, of human evolution. And you know what he has after a million years of doing this? The equivalent of a million years? He still has E. coli bacteria. Mm -hmm. And he's using his intelligence to try and get it to go in a certain way. All right? The I stands for irreducible complexity in life. Irreducible complexity. The idea that all the parts of a working system have to be in the right place at the same time for working order. You can't modify something gradually and still have function. This is true in the cell. This is true in the bacterial flagellum that, that propels uh, cells. This is, it's, it's true in so many areas of blood clotting, right? You've got to have all the all of the uh, processes and chemicals for blood clotting operating properly all at one place in order to have blood clotting. You can't do it in a sequential way or in a gradual way, I should say, and yet this is what uh, Darwinism tries to say that we got here gradually. Mm -hmm. uh, the F stands for the fossil record. The fossil record does not show Darwinism. The fossil record seems to show instantaneous creation because the Cambrian explosion that goes back, according to their dating, 550 million years ago, occurred in a, ge a geologic instant where you have 20 out of the 28 body, body plants they call phyla appear in the fossil record instantaneously without any fossil precursors. Even Richard Dawkins says it looks a lot like creation, as if they were just placed there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> And then the E stands for epigenetic information in the acronym LIFE. Epigenetic information is the structure of a living thing, say even a cell. Mm -hmm. You used to think you could just mutate DNA and get a new body plan. No, you can't, you can't get a new body plan from just mutating DNA. You have to get different structures in order to get new body plans, and you can't mutate epigenetic information. This is why back in 2016, the Royal Society over in London, a very astute scientific affiliation or association, called a meeting. And the meeting said, the current theory of macroevolution doesn't work. We need a new theory. Let's get together and talk about it. Well, they talked about it and didn't come up with a new theory. Just, it's interesting. Just as the scientific community is understanding that neo-Darwinism doesn't work, some in the church are going, we ought to accept Darwinism. You're going... Man, could you be any more behind the times? Yeah. 
All right. So sweet. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Wyatt. Yes, sir. What's your name? My name is Ken. Ken, go ahead, sir. And I want to say just thank you, Dr. Frank. This was a tremendous presentation that you gave. Well, thank evening. you. Did my mom pay you? <laughs> no, no. She okay, didn't. all right, good. But I just wanted to share with you, I saw a movie today that is out just during Holy Week. Uh-huh. It's called His Only Son. His Only Son. It was produced by the same company that produced The Chosen. Uh-huh. The, the individual that wrote it, directed it, and so mm -hmm. forth, spoke before the movie, mm. and then after the movie, and he asked everybody that watched that movie, he says, tell your friends, tell people about this movie. Is it in theaters? It's in some theaters, not every theater. It, right. It's only going to be there, I, I understand, the rest of Holy Week. Okay. But they're all around the country. His only son. His only okay. son. It's about uh, Abraham and oh, Isaac. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think I saw a trailer for that it's now a, that you mentioned uh, it. Yeah, yeah, it's about okay. Abraham and Isaac. Okay, and good. And it's incredibly well done. All right, good. And we got to get the word out. Good. And, and they're even to the point now, they've had a lot of don people that are donating, uh -huh. that anybody in the world where it's going to be shown, if they can't afford it, they can get in free. So, because Ken, are you saying that this is a Christian movie? Yes, and yes, there's, there's absolutely. No, there's no cheese in it? No, no, it's, it's, it's legitimate. It's Miracles biblical. do it's occur. Uh, yeah, Miracles I know that. Occur. No, no it, it's, it's strong in the Bible. It is All right. fantastic. All right. Just as fantastic as your presentation tonight. Oh, well, tonight. thank you, thank you. So thank he you, asked sir. me to tell people, so I'm telling you, go see that movie. All right, excellent. By the way, there's another movie coming out. I saw a pre-screening of it. It comes out on the 14th, I think. It's called Nefarious. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the pre-screen? Yeah. yeah, it's quite riveting. Uh, you, it's, it's not for kids, but it's, there's no sex or violence in it. It's just, well, there's a little bit, but it's, it's really about demonic possession. Yeah. Quite it, an interesting his next piece. movie is going to be about Jacob. That's okay. going to be the title, Jacob. All right. he, he had been working on this movie, this movie for over 10 years. Beautiful. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. You know, I've heard, and I don't know if, if you guys have heard anything new, I thought that the... The Resurrection, Mel Gibson's follow-on to The Passion is being filmed now. Have you guys heard that? or yeah. Is that true? Yeah. That's what I've heard anyway. It's kind of been secret. Yes, sir. What's Hi, Dr. Yeah, what's your name? Uh, I'm Kyle. Kyle? Kyle, yes. Kyle, yes, sir. So uh, my question is about, um, I guess, God's nature. Mm -hmm. I guess God's identity, really. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, coming from a Christian background, um, it's always, I've always understood that God to be God is good. His nature is is good, uh -huh. and um, you know I think you touched on this a little bit with objective morals uh -huh. and how um, that's grounded in God's nature. Mm -hmm. uh, my my question essentially is about um, you didn't you, you didn't cover I guess the the evidence for from theism going into Christianity in this, but my question is, um, can we say God is good? before even diving into Christianity? Or do we have to go into Christianity before we can discuss, um, I guess, God's nature? Well, no, you can know that through natural revelation that God is a moral being because you have this moral law written on your heart. This is why Paul says in Romans 2, the Gentiles are not the law of the law written on their heart. So everybody intuitively knows right and wrong. In fact, if you needed a Bible to know right and wrong, then God was unjust for judging the entire generation of Noah, right? They didn't have a Bible, okay? Yet he judged them because they knew right and wrong. Same thing with the Canaanites. He judged them because they intuitively knew right and wrong because God had written it on their hearts. So on the big issues, everybody intuitively understands right and wrong. Now, you can be talked out of that by sin and by a bad culture and by propaganda like our culture's doing, but... As soon as you're old enough to know what murder is and know what wrong is, you know that murder's wrong. You can be talked out of it, but you know it's wrong. So everybody intuitively knows that. Now, Christianity is the only world religion, or let me put it another way, Christianity is the world religion that gave us the idea that God is love that God is uh, someone who gives us rights. You could say you got that from Judaism as well, but 
you don't you don't get that say from Islam, right? In fact, even movements in our society now, like the LGBTQ movement, what do they take as true? Oh, love is love, right? So they're trying to take something from the Christian worldview and get it to work in their system. In effect, in my view, what they're doing is they're stealing from God while they're arguing against him. They have to take something that only exists in the Christian God in order to say that we have certain rights to do X, Y, or Z. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Drew, did you just want to get... Clint to get up again and move the mic up? Is that why you? No, I just needed uh -huh. more air time. All right, that's fine. Money maker. Go right ahead. But um, you know, his question brought up something mm -hmm. that doing the homeless ministry is a, a gay couple came to us. We were just doing a Bible study, and they mm -hmm. interrupted us. They had an honest question. They said, why every time we have sex with each other do we feel guilty? It was a great mm -hmm. honest question. That wasn't my question, though. So I, I watched a lot of Stephen Meyer and intelligent design yes. and, and the study of the genome is such baby science. It's so new. Mm -hmm. You know, we've Newton's theory was it until Einstein said, yeah, he was kind of wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so what's next in this? Because as, as the, the secular scientists start to study, you know, 30,000 generations of E. coli and fruit flies, they're starting to see that the DNA acts a little funny. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, we thought most of DNA was just junk, was right, dead. Exactly. And, uh, now we're finding with our science, good science, whether they're Christian or not, that sometimes when you put new energy or new circumstances, the DNA just pops to life mm. and does something. So we, we, what's next in this study? Because, I mean, if God may have created the Earth 6,300 years ago, I, if he wanted to do that, he could. But I think his creation is so much more complex than that that we'll ever know. Sure, I'm, since I'm not on the front end of the scientific, the scientific research, I don't know what's next, but I want to piggyback on something you said, which is very important, because you'll hear some people who claim that science can only look for natural causes and can never consider intelligent causes. They will say that if you say there's an intelligent cause out there, like a god, that's a science stopper. You're just going to stop doing science and say, well, God did it. It's a God of the gaps argument. When in reality, and some, some Christians have done that illegitimately, illegitimately, but in reality, you know what's happening now? Darwinism is a science stopper because of what you just said. Uh, for years, scientists thought that only 2% of the genome coded for proteins. 98% they thought was useless junk left over from the trial and error process of Darwinism. And so they never bothered to investigate it. Yet intelligent design scientists began to investigate that genome thinking, I bet it's doing something and we don't know what it does. And you know what they realized? At least one of the things the non-coding region does, it turns things on and off in the cell. You say, why is that important? Because these intelligent design people are saying, maybe we could go in and turn off cancer cells, right? So here they are trying to find cures to cancer because they believe the genome is intelligently designed, whereas the Darwinists are saying, don't even look at it. It's just junk. Who's the science stopper now? You know, it's like it's the, guy, the Darwinists. It's like the guy who found the ocean currents. He thought maybe the Bible in Psalms is literally correct. There are pathways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he found the ocean currents. Yes. And now we travel, what, 100 times faster around That's the world right. now. Yeah. Well, thank you, cool. Drew. Appreciate it. All right, folks. I think that's probably our last question. Well, you guys can't stay for three hours? Let's no. Stay. I mean, come on. Where are your priorities? You've got to eat. All right, that's right. Glory's coming right there. He's got to eat. All right, folks, I want to let you know, and those folks watching out in Internet land, wherever you are, or even the folks here, you guys are over here, uh, that Monday night we'll be at uh, Virginia, no, sorry, we're going to be at Louisiana Christian University. We're going to be doing If God, Why Evil? Next night at, at uh, Louisiana Tech, we'll be doing I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. So check all that out later this month. At some point, we're going to be at the University of New Hampshire as well. So keep track of all that. And also, any of you out near California will be May 6th, the Unshaken Conference with myself, Elisa Childers, and Natasha Crane at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills with the great Jack Hibbs. So I hope to see you guys there. Thanks so much. Thanks, folks.